Anyway, today we're starting a new series. Did everybody enjoy the last series that we did on Ecclesia? I thought it was absolutely fantastic and I got so much out of it. Today, just at this campus, we are starting a series called Words and Warfare. Over the next three weeks, we're going to look at one of my favorite Bible characters. I've got two favorite characters. One of them's Deborah. We're not looking at Deborah. The second one is Hannah. And Hannah, her story is found in the Old Testament in the book of Samuel. And Hannah is one of my favorite Bible characters. And for me, as a Christian, I was brought up in a Christian home. I became a Christian when I was seven. That means I gave my heart to Jesus then. And Hannah has had such a massive impact on my faith journey. And I'm hoping that over these next three weeks, that Hannah's story is going to really resonate with each of us in here. She's an amazing woman of God. And honestly, the things that we're going to look at, so we're going to look at the power of persistent prayer. We're going to look at the power of obedience. But today, I have the privilege of speaking about the power of words. Anybody ever said anything they've regretted? Just me. Oh, a few of us as well. Has anyone ever said something, they've said it and they've thought, oh, I wish I could take that back? Well, I'm going to confess something to you today. I have the ability to put my foot in it in situations where no one else would. I am so bad at putting my foot in it that my family and Phil's family and my close friends will phone me and say, hmm, I've done a Claire. (laughs) There are so many stories that I could share with you about the times that I've put my foot in it. And there are so many stories that I absolutely cannot share. (laughs) But I'm going to tell you about a time when I was about oh, probably about 10 years old, and my sister would have been eight years old, and we were brought up in a Christian home. My dad used to go and preach all over England, so it wasn't uncommon on a Sunday for us to be put in the car. We'd travel to wherever we were going to. We would always go out to somebody's house for tea at the church where my dad was preaching. It was just part of our normal routine. There was one particular Sunday that my dad was preaching at a beautiful village, let's call it Bakewell, because that's where it was, in Derbyshire. And we were invited to a very posh house for tea. Now, as a parent now, I understand the stress that that would have put my mum under. Now, normally, my parents were so careful about what they said in front of me and my sister They were involved in leadership in the church and we never knew of any issue or concern that was happening in the church because they were so wise in not sharing anything in front of me or my sister Helen. But on this occasion, I heard my mum say, I really wish we didn't have to go to this particular house in Bakewell. The reason was it was because it was so posh. Their children had grown up and left home. And the thought of my mum having to take her two girls, who were not quiet little wallflowers, to a posh house for tea, did not fill her with confidence. Anyway, we went. We got in the car. Drove all the way to Bakewell. We got out the car. Oh, in the car, by the way, we had the, don't forget your manners. Speak when you're spoken to. Don't you dare show me up. That's where I got it from, lads. (laughs) We arrived at this posh house. The posh lady opened the door. We went inside, and honestly, it was like, you don't touch anything. And the lady said to my mum in a really lovely, welcoming manner, I've been so looking forward to seeing you. And my mum turned round and said, and I've been so looking forward to seeing you. And it was at that point that I got involved. (laughs) And I said, no, you haven't. (laughs) You said, 
And I repeated what my mum had said. If looks could kill, I would not be here today. <laughs> There's a word of warning for any parent in this place. And giants, young people, never ever do that to your children. The consequences are not worth it, trust me. Anyway, today we are going to look at the power of words in the story of 1 Samuel. So if you've got your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 1 and we're going to read the first seven verses. If you've not got your Bibles, don't worry, the words will be on screen. Is it by magic? They just come on. There was a certain man from Ramathame, a Zophite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jeraham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Penina and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her and the Lord had closed her womb. Now listen to this carefully. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival, Penina, kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Just to give you some background information, it's always good to put scripture into context. Elkanah was the husband of two wives, and that is where Phil thinks he went wrong. I don't understand that. I mean, why would you not want two of me? Anyway, Elkanah had Hannah and Penina. But Elkanah, he was a man who knew the importance of worshipping God. During that period of time, there was a general neglect of worshipping the true living God within that nation. People were choosing to worship idols, false gods. They were following false teaching. But Elkanah didn't allow what was going on around him to distract him from what God wanted him to do. And it tells us that year after year, Elkanah and his family, which was made up of Hannah, Penina, and Elkanah and Penina's children, went up year after year to the temple at Shiloh. It would have been a 12-mile journey from Ramah to Shiloh. But it wouldn't have been a journey like we would have. You know, I think of a 12-mile journey, I'll nip in my car and 15 minutes I'm there. This would have been on foot. Commentators believe that they maybe would have had one or two donkeys, but most of them would have been walking. It wouldn't have been a journey of taking in the scenic views. It would have been a journey of discord. A journey that involved a whole lot of discord because Hannah and Penina were not the best of friends. Penina, year after year, taunted Hannah on her journey with cruel words, so much so that she wasn't able to sit at the table with her husband. She wasn't able to sit and eat the worship meal with her family. You know, church today, we need to be so aware of the power of our words. Has anyone heard that little saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me? What a load of rubbish. What a load of rubbish. I don't know about you, but I know there's been times in my life when I've been hurt by somebody's words. And I also know there'll have been times when my words have hurt somebody too. Penina's words brought Hannah to a place of distress, a place where she couldn't eat, a place 
where all she could do was weep. Words are so powerful. Our words are actually a gift from God. But like so many other gifts from God, we have to have the wisdom in how we use them. You know, words have the, the ability to speak life into a situation. They have the ability to bring challenge, and challenge is good. They have the power to encourage. They have the power to comfort. The power to heal. The power to change a circumstance. The power to change something from positive to negative and the other way around. They also have the power to influence somebody's opinion of somebody else and not always in a good way. They have power to bring disunity. They have power to bring disharmony. The word of God has a great deal to say about the power of our words. And there's no way we could look at that without turning to the book of James. So turn with me to James chapter 3. And we're just going to read a few verses about what James says about the power of our words. And he starts by acknowledging this. Indeed, we all make many mistakes. I read that and I think, thank goodness for that. I'm not on my own. For if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. We can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in his mouth. And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches. But a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It's a whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body, it can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. James sets the tone right here. He starts by addressing the power of words. If we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could control ourselves in every other way. And how true is that? I remember that my gran, who was such a godly lady, used to say to me, Claire, you've been given two eyes, two ears, one mouth. And what she was really saying was, Claire, use these more and these more than this. And I just wonder today, if Penina had opened her eyes and seen Hannah's barrenness, if Penina had opened her ears and listened to the tears of Hannah's heartache, I wonder if that would have made a difference to what came out of here. You know, James also gives us a profound view of the power of our words. He's letting us know that nothing can set us up more to fail than the power of our tongue. And what he means by that is an uncontrolled tongue puts you in the arena of gossip, the arena of false teaching, the arena of deception, the arena of exaggeration, the arena of flattery, the arena of lying, to name just a few. You know, without our tongue, it's almost impossible to speak. Isn't it amazing that such a small little thing has such power over us? I've been reading recently, there's a picture of a lady called Kelly Rogers. It's going to come on the screen. And she's really unique. She was born with a condition called congenital aglosia. She was born with only the base of her tongue. And in 2017, there were only 11 documented cases of people being born with this condition. 
In the interview I read, she said that despite being born without a tongue, she was still able to speak. She was still able to taste. She was even still able to kiss. And she described herself as being lucky. She said, I'm lucky because so many other people who have a problem with their tongue are not able to speak and function in the way that I can. And then the interviewer said to her, what was your childhood like? And Kelly described her when she started at preschool that she was teased day in and day out by this same little girl. And this little girl used to go up to her and say, your mouth's crooked. And Kelly used to sit and think, well, my mum and dad told me that I was awesome. But one day, Kelly decided that she would use the power of her words to change a situation round. And this same little girl came up to her and said, your mouth's crooked. And Kelly turned around and went, I know. Do you want to play? And the little girl took a step back and said, okay. They became firm friends. And Kelly's crooked mouth was never mentioned by the same young girl again. Do you see, church, how the power of words can be used to change something from an horrendous situation into something so much more beautiful? You know, James, in the passage that we've just read, he tells us that the tongue is like a raging fire. The tongue can be just that small spark that sets off a whole lot of destruction. And you know, today in this place, I am convinced that some of you have been so hurt by the power of somebody else's words. Today, know that you are loved. Know that you are valued. Know that you are cared for. You know, and know that as Kelly Rogers knew her parents thought she was awesome, God thinks you're awesome. And I think you're pretty awesome too. But seriously, today, if you're hurting because of the power of somebody's words, don't go today without speaking to somebody. We've got an amazing connect area over here with people who've got just such a heart to pray with people. A heart that says, I want the best for you. So don't go today without speaking to somebody. Don't go today without asking someone to sit and pray with you. And I promise you it will be confidential. And if you ever want to come and see Phil and I or Tina or any of the other pastors here, then please know we don't want you to suffer in silence. We want to be part of your journey. Your journey is going deeper into your relationship with God. You know, for those of us that are Christians in this place, please don't think that this is a message where we're trying, or I'm trying to condemn anyone. It's not about that at all. This is a reminder for me probably more than all of you in this place. And it's good, isn't it, to check ourselves. It's good to just, you know, have a little bit of reflection and just think about what we've said and what we've done. But also to think about how we can use our words to make a massive de dint in the kingdom of God. You know, I, um, for most of you that know, I work part-time for church and then I've got my own little business. And a couple of weeks ago, I'd gone to visit a family to do with the work I do outside of church. And when I got into their living room, I saw a big jar on the windowsill and it had the words across it, anti. So I immediately thought it was an anti-swear jar. And I'm thinking, gosh, the language must be pretty bad in this place because the jar was nearly full. 
Thankfully, I didn't say that to them. But I said to them, what's the jar for? Expecting them to say an anti-swear jar. And they said that we just decided as a family that our words weren't being particularly kind. That we were using our words to destroy one another rather than build one another up. So that's our jar. So if anyone says anything that's anti to what we're trying to build in our family home, put a pound in the jar. And I was thinking, a lot's gone on in here because that jar was nearly full. But then it got me thinking, how full would my jar be? And I think that's a really good place to start when we're personally reflecting is to say, how full would mine be? You know, when Penina taunted Hannah, she did it in front of her children. On the journey that they made from Rama to Shiloh, it says that Elkanah was there with his two wives, Hannah and Penina, and Penina's sons and daughters. The children would have heard their mum taunt their stepmum. I just wonder what Penina's words did for that future generation. You know, we have a responsibility to pass on things to our future generation. I know that I've had to be so careful what I say in front of my boys a, because I don't want them to drop me in it, but also, I don't want to build a future for them that's built on lies, discouragement, mistrust. I want it to be a life that's built on faith, a life that's built on encouragement, a life that's built on changing something negative into something positive. I want it to be a life that's built on we don't do that here in this house, but we're kind to people in this house. We speak the truth about people. We don't have anything coming into our house that puts somebody else down. And I just wonder today, is that what we're doing in this place? Is that what we're doing in our own homes? How are we building a world for our future generation using the power of our words. God makes it pretty clear on what we're meant to do and what we're meant to pass on to the next generation. In Psalm 145, verse 4, it says this, Let each generation tell its children of your mighty acts. Let them proclaim your power. Deuteronomy 4, verse 9 says this, Only be careful and watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them fade from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. Moses in this verse, he wanted to make sure that the people of Israel passed on the miracles that they'd seen, passed on the stories of God's faithfulness, passed on the stories of God's power, passed on the stories of God's goodness. And you know, church, that's true for us today. We have a responsibility to pass on to future generations. And when these guys have had children, it's also our responsibility and your responsibility to pass on to future generations the goodness of God, the faithfulness of God, God's mighty power. Ephesians 4 verse 29 says this. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to others who hear them. I love the story of the two frogs. Does anyone else know the story of the two frogs? My friend Judith. <laughs> there was a group of frogs. Well, they wouldn't be walking, would they? They'd be like hopping through the woods, a bit like this. 
And these group of frogs were hopping merrily through the woods when two frogs fell down a pit. The other frogs gathered around the pit and they were looking at it and thinking, doesn't look good. So they started to shout to the two frogs, their mate, let's call them Ben and Fred. They started to say, Ben, Fred, give up. Give up. You'll never make it. Just turn, lie down and die. Well, they carried on, Ben and Fred, hopping and hopping and hopping. And eventually, Ben lay down and died. But Fred kept on hopping. The group of frogs shouted even louder, Don't do it, Fred. Just join Ben. Just give up. Just give up. And eventually, Ben did the biggest leap and he hopped right out of the pit onto the side and he made it. The group of frogs turned to him and said, Ben, did you not hear what we were saying to you? And Ben turned around and said, nope, I'm deaf. I thought you were all encouraging me. (laughs) A funny story, but a simple story that illustrates that proverb in chapter 18. There is power of life and death in the tongue. You know, we live in a culture, don't we, where people are out for themselves. We only have to turn the telly on to see that. We only have to look at social media to see that people are out for themselves. They want the next best thing. They want to do what they want to do. And that can so often creep into the church. So often the things that are spoken about are the things that aren't going that well. It might be that you didn't like what somebody's wearing on stage or it might be that somebody didn't talk to me this morning. It might be we didn't sing my favourite song. You know the sort of things I mean, don't you? I've been guilty of that too. But you know, as I look around today, and I look in this place, I am so thankful for the people that make this happen. I spoke to Noah this morning, who was here early and here every week early to make the camera work. I look at Craig sat on the bleachers. You know, Craig has made sure that for the last six months, we have been kept so safe during COVID, and if anyone was to come here and inspect this place, we would not have been shut down. I look at Jeanette, who does so many risk assessments for us. I look at Robert and Lucia and know that the hours and hours and hours of stuff that they've poured into church. I look at Lisa, who leads our Amazing Giants program. I look at Tina, who just does incredible stuff and gives amazing interviews on radios. I look at Tom, a young lad who's prepared to come to worship practice along with Spencer. You know what? And I look at all it. Sheila, prayer warrior, you need prayer? Go to Sheila. That's where I go. We have an amazing church. And it would be so much more amazing if from now on we make the decision that when we come through that door, we're not going home until we've encouraged five people. We are called to encourage one another. You know, when we gather together as a family, because that's what we are, it's good to say, you look good today, or I've been praying for you today, or is everything okay? And church, I'm not saying that doesn't happen, but I think we need to get better at that. I need to get better at that. Phil needs to get better at that. Don't worry, I won't call anyone else's name out. (laughs) Being a Christian is tough. Anyone find it tough? Because I do. But do you know what makes it better? When my brothers and sisters, my family of God, lift my arms up. When they encourage me. When I get a text to say, keep going. When I get a text to say, I'm praying for you. And... 
let's be that to each other. Penina had a cruel tongue. Maybe she had so many issues, I don't know. It doesn't really tell us very much about Penina. But what I do know is that she used her tongue to try to destroy somebody. Had a huge impact on Hannah. And today as a church, I'm just wondering whether when we get an opportunity in a minute, if you will choose to speak truth over lies. If you will choose to speak encouragement over discouragement. If you will choose to speak words of life, not death. If you would choose to speak words of affirmation, not criticism. If you will choose to speak words of love, not hate. If you will choose to speak kindness over malice. If you will choose to say with the psalmist, may these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, my Lord, my rock, and my Redeemer. I want to give us an opportunity to respond today together as family. As a commitment to each other. If you're on this journey with me, I want you to stand before God to say that from now on, you're going to be more intentional with your words. You're going to use them in the way that God wants us to, the way that God asks us to. Doesn't mean that you won't get it wrong from time to time. Trust me, I'm the expert in that. But today I'm standing to say, God, before you and before my brothers and sisters in this place, I'm going to be intentional to encourage people. I'm going to be intentional to speak words of goodness and faithfulness over that amazing generation down there and the generation after that. If you're with me and there is no pressure, stand with me because we're doing this before God. Maybe if you feel comfortable, you just want to lift out your, heart, your arms in front of you. And that's just a, a symbol of saying, I surrender to you, God. Heavenly Father, for the times we've got it wrong, forgive us. For the times that we should have remained silent, forgive us. For the times we should have encouraged somebody and we haven't, then, Father, we, we say sorry. Please forgive us. And Father, before you today, we're saying we want to be intentional with our words. We want to use them to pass on stories of your faithfulness, your goodness to every generation. We want to use our words to build up our family here, to build up the local church. Father, I pray you'll help us. Father, for anyone that's hurting from somebody's words, God, just let them know that you're right there with them. That you're wrapping your arms around them. 
that they know they're loved and valued and cared by you. Father, today, in this place, we want to honour you with our words. We want to lift your name high with our words. We want to use our mouths that praises you in a way that honours you. And I ask that you would help each and every one of us standing here today to do that. Father, I pray that you would put the right people around us. People that we can trust. I pray that for those that don't have that close friend, that iron sharpens iron friend, that, that you would provide that, God. Father, we just say, have your way in each and every one of us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now you can just take your seats. Do you know the, the very mouth that we use to, to chat, to, to speak, to pray? It's also the the same organ that we use to declare that Jesus is Lord. In Romans 10 verse 9, it says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And I'd just like everyone to close their eyes. Because today, if you've not accepted Jesus as your saviour, you might have been coming to church for years. And while it's great to be here, that doesn't make you a child of God. It tells us very clearly in the word of God that we have to declare with our mouths that Jesus is Lord. We have to believe in our heart that God raised his son Jesus from the dead. And the reason he had to do that was because Jesus died on a cruel cross for you and for me to bridge the gap between sin and our Heavenly Father. And when we come to the cross, when we say, Jesus, I want you to be my Lord. I believe in my heart that you died for me. And I'm sorry for the sin, anything I've done wrong that separates me from my Heavenly Father. And when we do that, we become a child of God. And while every head is bowed and our eyes are closed, I'm going to pray. And if you've never done that, then pray alongside me today in your heart. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you sent Jesus to die on that cruel cross at Calvary for me. I thank you that you sent your son to bridge the gap. And right now I say, sorry for all the wrong things I've done. Forgive me. I repent, I turn around, and I enter into a new relationship with my Heavenly Father. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for cleaning me from the inside out. Father, have your way in me today. In Jesus' name. While every eye is still closed, if you've responded to that prayer today for the first time, then just lift your hand and then when I've acknowledged it, I'll tell you to pop your hand down. But if you have accepted Jesus into your life today, just raise your hand. Thank you. Okay. And Father, thank you for what you've done in this place today. And Father, today, as we leave this place, may our lives be changed. Changed because we want to be more and more like you. Help us with that, Father. In Jesus' name.
Amen. You know, when someone gives their heart to Jesus, the angels rejoice in heaven. And we're going to do that now. So come on, guys, let's rejoice. (laughs) 